jump. Oh, this thing. Uh, can you get that house lights on? So I think I'm gonna stop here. just a little ways west of here, uh, in Santa Monica. Uh, I will have been a professional game designer for exactly 20 years next month, I think on the 18th of November. I've worked at Naughty Dog for the past seven and a bit years, and in that time, I've been lucky enough to work on a string of uh, really great games with a large group of some of the most amazingly talented game developers in the whole world. I've also played quite a lot of independent games in that time. Uh, and before we get started, I want to apologise uh, in advance if this talk is a little bit scattershot. We had to have a pretty busy summer putting together Uncharted 3, but hopefully we'll find a through line here today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first, what I'm interested in, and how I got into game design. I grew up in a small rural town called Newent, which is in the southwest of England, uh, and it's where my parents still live. Uh, that's me and my little brother on holiday in Devon, uh, playing on the beach. And playing was my main thing when I was a kid. I loved to play. Uh, meal times, school, sleeping, all of that just really seemed to fill up the times in between the times when I could play. And in particular, I did a lot of kind of free form, unstructured play, dressing up as characters from Doctor Who and Star Wars and running around in the woods near our house. Now, this will become somewhat more relevant later. In 1981, when I was 13, uh, my parents bought me a second-hand Sinclair ZX81. Finally, I could play silent, monochrome versions of the games that I played in the amusement arcades <laughs> on holiday and down at the fish and chip shop, and I could play them all the time. I didn't need to put a 10 pence piece in the slot. This machine only had 1K of memory on board, Although we did have a 16K RAM pack that lost the games from its memory if it wobbled. But, um, but that, that RAM pack made it possible for me to play the flip out of Arctic Software's ZX81 Galaxians clone on the right here, and a really good Donkey Kong clone called Crazy Kong that used characters for the characters. <laughs> now, at the time, all games were indie games, uh, in spirit at least. 
After a few years, they were published by what had become quite big companies, but those companies started out very small and independent. And the games themselves were created by extremely small teams, usually just one or two people working out of their homes. I played this game on the left, 3D Monster Maze, uh, which featured a pseudo 3D maze and a Tyrannosaurus Rex that you might see if you keep your... There he is! Uh, and I saw... Uh, yes. Uh, drama, theatre in just a few characters. Uh, and I still have to invert the controls on the, the vertical aiming on the character action games I play because of this game on the right, uh, Scion's ZX81 Flight Simulator. A year or two later, we got the Sinclair Spectrum, and my gaming life exploded into colour and sound. My favourite games were Manic Miner, in top right, uh, and its sequel, Jet Set Willy, which set, really set the template for Metroid and similar multi-screen um, platform adventure games. <coughs> Action games like Pist and Jetpack, that you can see in top left, uh, by a company with the baffling name of Ultimate Play the Game, uh, which was a company that later became Rare, who we know for their, all of their amazing games. Uh, those, those simple action games evolved into more complex puzzler adventures like Saber Wolf on the bottom left and Alienate on the bottom right. And suddenly, I mean, these really felt like games from the future appearing in my, in my bedroom. I love this game called Ant Attack, which I think was the first free roaming isometric game uh, uh, that I played at home, at least. And I recently realized that it's kind of a spiritual forerunner of ICO, since you had to find and lead another person to safety in this vast, sprawling, mysterious city overrun by, by giant ants. And The Hobbit was the first graphical text adventure that I played, and it led me later on to Maniac Mansion and all of my other favorite scum system games. Um, now, like a lot of my peers, I kind of grew up as an indie-minded kid. The 1980s were when the technology of mass reproduction, uh, in the form of, most, uh, most importantly, I think, the cassette tape and the photocopier, cross-pollinated with young people's reactions to the pretty reactionary, often quite hypocritical status quo in the 1980s, in the, in the UK at least, uh, to create the indie music that we listen to and the indie zines and the comics that we read. So when I got to college, I studied physics and philosophy. Uh, and I really like the way that these two subjects seem to have pretty much everything in the world covered. Uh, in terms of subject matter. Uh, I'd always liked physics and math and logic as a kid. Uh, and in philosophy, which honestly I, I didn't really know too much about when I went away to college, I really discovered the life of the mind uh, and the value of asking difficult questions about uh, simple subjects that everyone takes for granted uh, and, and about not being satisfied until you get concrete answers. So after college, I lucked my way into a job with the English office of an American company called Microprose. And my first project was a port of F-15 Strike Eagle 2 to the Sega Genesis. It was the second ever real-time 3D game on the Sega Genesis. Uh, it was, this was 1993, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. And next, I worked on uh, this original platform game, whose graphics you can see here. Uh, this was also for the Sega Genesis. Um, Tinhead was originally going to be about a robotic exoskeleton that you initially thought was a, just a cute little robot. Uh, and it was going to have a kind of blaster master mechanic. Uh, there was going to be a little guy inside of his head who could jump out and walk around and get into places that Big Tinhead couldn't. Um, unfortunately, we had to scope it down because our team was so very small and it became a pretty straightforward Sonic clone. These wonderful graphics are by my friend Trevor Slater. Uh, and Trevor sadly died last year. He got this amazing pre-rendered look uh, just by pixel pushing in Dpaint, uh, which was a forerunner of Photoshop. My level design on this game was, was pretty woeful, really. Um, but we had some really nifty table-driven bullet physics, and I learned a huge amount making this game. So the tools we used uh, to make these games, like Deluxe Paint, uh, were pretty minimal by modern standards, and you could easily count our team sizes on just one hand. We were under tremendous pressure to produce, and with next to no resources, we somehow managed to pull gameplay out of thin air. The atmosphere at this time was very garage-like, very indie-spirited, uh, even though we were in this, this corporate environment. 
and that's something that's really still true at, at Naughty Dog today. The programmers that I, the programmers, specifically the programmers, although the artists and the audio guys that I work with on these uh, titles had, by and large, been a part of that programmer, uh, that bedroom programmer scene that had emerged in the 1980s that, that made the games that I grew up loving. And these guys were incredibly generous to me, considering that I didn't have nearly the video making experience and expertise that they did. Uh, and they really took the time to answer all of my questions about their work, about what was easy and what was hard to do, either in code or, or graphics or, or animation. So anyway, a few years later, fancying a change, I sent some resumes out, and the next thing I knew I was in California at Crystal Dynamics. I worked on two Gexes, a Pandemonium, and all three games in the Soul Reaver series, and I hoovered up skills and experience where, wherever I could. And while I was at Crystal, I met three of the developers that I now work with at Naughty Dog. Evan Wells, Bruce Straley, and Amy Hennig. Uh, Evan, Bruce, and I worked together on the Gex games, and Amy was the game director of the Soul Reaver series. Uh, Evan is now one of the two co-presidents of Naughty Dog. Bruce was the game director of Uncharted 2 Among Thieves, and Amy is the creative director of the Uncharted series. And it's really nice to have come so far with these guys, uh, and I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunities uh, to do the interesting work that, that they've given me over these. So I think the Uncharted series is what we're going to be known for for a long time. It's a rare opportunity to have been in on the ground floor of the conception of a new game world and then to be able to see through the creation of the first three games in the series. The series started with a very simple idea. We really just wanted to capture the spirit of pop adventure for a contemporary audience. In all of its thrills and spills, its comedy and romance, the mystery and the horror, and we really wanted to make an experience that felt like an action movie, but that you really played from moment to moment like an action video game. Well, hopefully you'll agree that it's worked out pretty well for us. Uncharted Drake's Fortune and Uncharted 2 Among Thieves have sold about 4 million copies each, and Uncharted 2 was a, a runaway hit and a, a huge critical success for us. We're now about to release Uncharted 3, Drake's Deception, which we've been working on for the last two years, uh, and it comes out on the 1st of November, and we can't wait to see what you think of it. <coughs> So the title of my talk is Beauty and Risk, Why I Love Indie Games. And I mentioned in the abstract for the talk that it's about the beauty of systems, the risk introduced by chance in one way or another. It's about creative risk taking, uh, but I also left it kind of deliberately theatrically vague. So I suppose I'd better start explaining myself. Human beings often find a straightforward beauty in static objects that have been produced by systems. In the enormity of structures uh, of the, in the inorganic physical world, like galaxies and mountains. In the basalt columns of Giant's Causeway in Ireland, where we see strikingly geometric structure and, and repetition. And of course, in the structure of plants, like these ferns, where we see recursion and fractal self-similarity. Uh, even in the simple rotational symmetry of, of cactus flowers, and in the, the weird beauty of some of the complex structures produced by organic systems, like these termite mounds. And then there's the structural beauty of the objects that human beings build by using systems, or the engineering systems that result in great works of architecture, both ancient and modern. But we can even find beauty in systemic structures that weren't designed to be aesthetic, that were designed to be solely functional. And in fact, we see systems and the structures they produce everywhere in design. Uh, in typography, as just one example, um, these insurance map uh, book front plates are from the early 1900s. They're so asymmetrical, and yet there's so much structure in amongst their detail. And then with the advent of digital computing came things like Conway's Game of Life. Here's a 3D version. My good friend Robert Olivier introduced me to L systems, which are mathematical models that produce structures that resemble ferns and trees. There are artworks like uh, these complexity graphics, uh, which are the work of Tatiana Pakova. I would love to play a video game that looked like this, where every dot had a meaning. And these uh, things like this 3D sculpture designed mathematically by Bathsheba Grossman. 
So I was a teenager when I first became aware of design as a discipline. I'm talking about design with a capital D. It's the design that unites industrial design with graphic design, furniture design with architecture, and so on. It was actually my mum who introduced me to the work of William Morris, the famous Victorian textile designer. Uh, I took these pictures with my phone last week in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, uh, there, off his work, of course. Um, now, for William Morris, uh, when the modern idea of design didn't even really exist yet, um, he had a, a vision of design as something that could help us all in our day-to-day -day lives and could ultimately be uplifting for all of humanity. This famous quote of his, have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. It was the first introduction I had to the idea that efficiency of function and the beauty of form are somehow interwoven in the way that we experience the design world around us. I think this statement is suggestive of design by subtraction, the famous principle that we often use. If it doesn't belong in the design or in your environment, if it doesn't make things better, then we should remove it. I was also reminded of this saying of Morris's uh, the first time I heard that uh, Shigeru Miyamoto makes the visual design for roughly half of the enemies in each of his games be based on cool ideas that they've had for gameplay function, while the other half of the enemies' looks are based on ideas that they've had for enemies that just look cool and interesting, or uh, whose look fits the story or the level, and then their function follows the look a little more. Now in both these cases, form and function have to eventually line up for the design to work optimally well. Uh, and in his book, The Design of Everyday Things, Donald Norman talks about the concept of affordance and the way that an object has certain uh, human preconceptions about the way that it can be used, um, built into its form, and how a designer can take advantage of those affordances or, or cannot take advantage of them. Now, uh, this kind of stuff is particularly important in character action game design of the kind that my colleagues and I do at Naughty Dog. Uh, and we talk about Donald Norman and uh, the similar ideas of other des designers all the time at work. I think that the more that game design matures, the more it falls into line with the idea that simplicity and clarity in design are desirable because they lead to designs that are both functional and beautiful. Now some of you, hopefully lots of you, maybe even nearly all of you, uh, will have heard Jonathan Blow's talk at GDC Europe this year. Uh, the talk's called Truth in Game Design. Uh, it's up for free on the GDC vault, and I wholeheartedly recommend that you, uh, that you go and watch it as soon as you possibly can. Uh, because of my busy summer, I only watched it for the first time a few days ago, uh, and I rushed to incorporate it into this talk, so apologies to Jonathan and everyone else for anything cat-handed that I do with his ideas. Having, desire, having defined the system as a set of rules causing behavior to occur over time, Jonathan goes on to articulate, very beautifully I think, the way that video games are special kinds of systems that let us, their players, peer into their innards. I'm paraphrasing him, and I hope I get this right, uh, but he says that games are systemic models, and these models are made up of rules that govern how the quantities of the resources in the system, the stock in systems theory language, change over time. Images and sounds representing the dynamics that arise from the rules and the resources in the system are presented to the player who can then see and hear what's going on in the system. And these rep representations uh, usually animate to show the system evolving over time. The player can then make inputs to the system that change its dynamic flow to try and move the system towards a goal, usually, but not always, the win condition of the game. Now, when this is coupled with the way that the game is structured so as to start simple and hold our attention over time as it builds towards complexity, uh, we, uh, the player, get the opportunity to perceive a system much more complex than any that we could understand simply from a cold start. or by looking at static graphs of, of, or flow diagrams of the system. Never mind trying to read the, the complex differential equations that we might use to express how, how quantities change over time. 
This one's for my uh, quantum electrodynamics possum. <laughs> a prize for anyone who can tell me what it is at the end. So the scientist, mathematician, and logician in me really likes that video games do this for us. They help us uh, create a logical, mathematical, spatial, symbolic model in our heads that is far more complex than any that we might be able to mentally model on our own. And human beings are already pretty damn good at recognizing patterns almost everywhere they occur. You can see the Dalmatian, right? As Frank Lance says, which Jonathan mentions in his talk, a wonderful thing about games is that they expose the mechanisms of our thoughts to us. And I highly recommend Frank's talk, Life and Death and Middle Pair, Go, Poker and the Sublime, which is also up for free on the GDC Vault. So games can be brain training to help us be as rational as we can be. And I, for one, va value rationality extremely highly. Rationality is what allows us to understand the world for what it truly is, instead of living in superstition. And it's what lets us do science and create technology, which in turn help elevate humanity away from our base animal condition uh, by feeding and housing us more comfortably, by allowing us to communicate with our loved ones over long distances, and to travel and play video games and eat ice cream whenever we like. So, Jonathan's talk is really fantastic. Uh, he goes into much greater depth than I have time to here. You should definitely go and uh, check it out. So, changing direction a little bit, I've become very interested in human attention over the last couple of years. <coughs> attention is, of course, the process of concentrating on one thing while ignoring or only partially attending to the other things around you. I've often thought it's surprising that considering the really fundamental role that attention plays in the way that video games actually work, we don't talk about it very much as an aspect of our players' experiences. Uh, although Eric Zimmerman and the team at Game Lab made a game about attention and partial attention several years ago. It was called Arcadia. I'm going to go uh, back and, and check it out. So it might be that we don't talk about attention very much um, because it's really hard to understand. Uh, psychologists became very interested in attention more than a hundred years ago now. It's almost like their main thing. Um, but they're really still only beginning to get to grips with, with what it is and how it works. So, there are lots of ways that attention is important for video games, but the one I want to talk about today is the way that games, I think, hold our attention by taking advantage of the fascination we develop when we can see system dynamics unfolding in front of our very eyes. In fact, I'd like to claim that the sight of an evolving system is a kind of beauty, in addition to the kind of static beauty of the, the systemically produced objects that we just saw. Now, I might be on iffy ground here, uh, and we can argue about the, the overlap and the differences between interestingness and beauty later, but it seems to me that there's something in this so if you'll bear with me for just a minute. Human beings have always enjoyed watching big natural systems as they unfold. We find meditative fascination in waves rolling into the shore and sunsets, clouds scudding overhead, waterfalls cascading down mountainsides. When I was in New Zealand over the holidays last year, we saw a bubbling volcanic mud pool called Ngamakaya Koko, whose name means playthings of Koko, who was a historic chief who would sit and watch these bubbling mud Completely clear. 
And games do this a lot, of course, whether we're accelerating time in SimCity or Osmos, or slowing it down in, in Max Payne or Uncharted 3. So watching traffic process and interweave along a freeway, looking at the mechanism of a mechanical watch, watching a, a stick carried under a bridge by a river, for all of the Who Sticks fans out there. Uh, all of these things can be fascinating, perhaps because they express both periodicity, motion, repeating, and time, which provides a kind of underlying structure to act as a sort of carrier signal for the variation, uh, the variation in the system which then sustains our interest beyond when we become bored by the repetition. Now, I think this also has a relationship to Jamie Griezmann's famous 30 seconds of fun in Halo, the full concept of which is that there's an unchanging underlying periodic structure with, com which combines with constant variation and change overlaid over the top in most of the great video games we love. I've often talked about the, the way that the core gamey parts of the games that I've worked on, up to and including Uncharted 3, act as a kind of carrier signal for mood and story and motion. So the beauty of systems plays an important role in holding our attention, I would like to claim. And that's really important for a game designer who wants to, to capture and hold their audience's interest for as long as it takes for the game that they're making to unfold. So that's systems and attention. How about systems and art? Artists have become more and more interested in systems and the artifacts that they produce over the course of the 20th century and the early 21st century. The American artist Sol LeWitt, uh, who is considered the founder of both minimal and conceptual art, devised sets of rules that he would then use to create things like this colorful painting. Uh, pop into San Francisco MoMA uh, next time you're there and you'll see uh, some of his work in the lobby. Now the Dutch artist Theo Janssen designs these walking, wind-driven machines, and then he evolves them over successive generations into ever more complex and interesting kinetic sculptures that haunt the beaches of the Netherlands near, near where he lives, and which he hopes he can eventually just release into the wild and let roam. <laughs> so the world of procedural and algorithmic art is an area that I'm really incredibly excited about for the very near future of independent art games. Uh, and I think that uh, our friend Brandon Boyer and his new website, Venus Patrol, let's hear it for Venus Patrol, yes? I think Venus Patrol is going to do an amazing job of bringing us information about games that look amazing uh, because of their systemic nature. Artists like Casey Reese, this is Casey's work right here, and Zach Gage and Daniel Schiffman and Robert Hodgin, uh, this is a piece by Robert, all of whom we are incredibly lucky to have at IndieCade this year, by the way. They're, they're going to be in conversation with Andy Nealon tomorrow afternoon. These artists are all very interested in systems and the artifacts and experiences that they produce. And they're proving to be tremendously influ influential on the upcoming generation of indie game makers. So next, I want to extend our thinking about the system of the game to another system. A system orders of magnitude more complex than any we could possibly model in a game. A human being. Now, in philosophical terms, I'm a physicalist. So I believe that human beings are wholly material. We're made of the same fundamental particles that make up every other part of the universe, and both our minds and our bodies inasmuch as those things are even separable, and I think that they're probably not, uh, are, are produced by the same biomechanical processes that follow the same laws of physics as everything else in the world. So it stands to reason, then, that we are systems too. And when we consider the system of a game and the way that a human being interacts with the dynamics that it produces, we're actually looking at a big, unimaginably complex system with us as a part of it. I even wonder whether our fascination with systems, which I just talked about, is to do with a recognition on our part of our own fundamentally systemic nature. We're governed by regular cycles. We have to sleep every day, and stuff has to go into and, and come out of us at regular The discussion of a game system to subjective aspects of our experience. 
Now, this is philosophically extremely risky. Uh, and I bet that I get browbeaten about it afterwards, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. Beauty and risk. Yeah. So, you see, I think that great literary stories do the same thing with psychological and moral calculus that video games do with spatial numerical sums in the way that Jonathan Blow describes. And that stories, narrative, uh, and importantly, less constrained literature like, like poetry let us understand things about the relationships between human beings that would otherwise be too difficult to understand. Think of how you feel at the end of a season of The Wire, uh, or at the end of a long Herzog film, or, or a good novel, or any great story with a long, slow start. The depth of understanding you have about the motivations of the characters and the complexity of their relationships is, is really profound, maybe even more profound than you can easily encounter in your, in your daily life. In 2007, a group of researchers at the University of Toronto in Canada, which included Keith O'Lee, uh, Maya G. Kick, and Raymond Marr, published the findings of a study they conducted into the relationship between reading fiction and empathy and social skills. The study showed that just as people's skills as pilots improve when they spend time on a flight simulator, so people's ability to model the emotional states of others improve when they spend time reading fiction. They used a thing called uh, a mind in the eyes test, which was devised by uh, Simon Baron Cohen from the University of Cambridge. Uh, this test measures empathy and social acumen by gauging people's responses uh, and ability to evaluate isolated images of other people's eyes. And they found that fiction readers had substantially greater empathy and, and performed somewhat better on an interpersonal perception test than re people who read predominantly non-fiction, and that this correlated to a higher level of social ability. Now, I wouldn't for a minute want to say that this is valuable uh, because you can become a better schmoozer at cocktail parties if you read more novels. I think that would be pretty gross. <laughs> but I do want to suggest that one path to happiness in life lies in learning how to have closer emotional relationships with other people and in having a rich, flexible, adaptable inner life and a sense of interconnectedness with the world. So, how to bring this back around to games? Well, as you know, if you've played the Uncharted games, or Jack and Daxter, or even Crash Bandicoot, we're very interested in storytelling games and Naughty Dog. Indeed, lots of people are interested in storytelling and video games. It's very much discussed, and there are lots of different approaches, and it gets very complicated very quickly. Uh, I particularly encourage you to seek out uh, a couple of talks by um, two pairs of my colleagues. Creating the Active Cinematic Experience of Uncharted 2 Among Thieves by Bruce Straley and Neil Druckmann, uh, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, Amy Hennig and Josh Scher's talk about our performance capture process, uh, both of which they gave at GDC in 2010. Um, I think they are, uh, you'd have to get GDC Vault Access to, to see these. Um, but if you want to know more about just how technical our process has become, uh, in making a story game like Uncharted, and how hard we have to think uh, about the structure of both the gameplay and the story then, uh, to make these games, then please seek out those talks. But I want to nudge us now in the direction of the idea that narrative, in a, a looser, less structured sense uh, than, uh, than that which we use uh, in the Uncharted games, is interesting, and that there's a, a lot for us to do creatively there. Now, I don't need to tell anyone here at IndieK how inspiring the world of indie games is. Uh, the games in this year's competition are absolutely stunning. Uh, the game styles and the subject matter are so incredibly diverse, uh, and the production values are on the same stratospheric trajectory as they've been for years now at IndieK. Uh, I'm really looking forward to playing them uh, all this weekend and meeting their creators, in, uh, as I'm sure you are. You saw about 20 of my favorite games in my uh, opening slides there, most of them indie games. Um, uh, but, and you can probably tell that I didn't play nearly enough games this summer. Too busy. <coughs> I think that most of us would also agree that video games in general are pretty brilliant. The history of mainstream games has given us hundreds, thousands of amazing, inspiring games 
that have developed a form with uh, a unique character which synthesizes interaction with audiovisual, mechanical, and spatial technology to create experiences for human beings unlike any that we've been able to have in the whole course of human history. But while mainstream video games are bound to operate within commercial constraints, usually skewing somewhat away from art and towards entertainment, indie games are free to operate in any space they damn well please, and to take risks that mainstream games can't. I think that's very important, not just for human culture in general, but for the mainstream part of the game industry too. Because indie games can break ground that we in the mainstream might not have the courage to. We can then learn from the lessons that indie games have to teach and make our games better by turn. Now, I have some first-hand experience of this. When we were planning the structure of Uncharted 2, we thought hard about the role that the player's attachment, or lack of attachment, to the friendly, allied characters in the game would play in the success of the emotional arc of the experience. And the structure of the game really had to support these attachments and could either serve to undermine or reinforce them. Uh, one example of this, and spoiler alert, put your fingers in your ears if you haven't played Uncharted 2. Uh, one example is the way that Chloe helps you throughout the, the, uh, the war-torn uh, Nepalese city uh, so that her betrayal of you at the end would, would hurt even worse. Uh, now, I ended up taking... Um, uh, responsibility for the production of one sequence that was also important in this way, and which was a creative risk for us. And it's a sequence that I'm happy to say has become, it's one of the sequences that has become a kind of emblematic of the interactive cinematic techniques that Uncharted 2 used. It's uh, chapter 16, Where Am I? Better known as The Peaceful Village. Now, I can't take credit for the original idea for this. Uh, that was down to, I think, uh, Bruce and Amy and, uh, and Neil. Uh, the idea was, and more spoilers ahead, watch out, um, that we could use an interactive, explorative sequence to show the village on a quiet day with clear weather and to show the villagers who lived there just happily going about their daily business. Then we would travel through a dangerous cave system in the mountains near the village, being helped by uh, Tenzin, who we'd only just met. He's the village leader. Uh, and we'd seen that he has a, a small daughter in the cutscene where we met him. Then, when we finally returned to the village later to find it under siege by an army that had followed us, the player, Nathan Drake there, we would feel particularly bad and responsible um, much more so than if we'd just been dropped into another video game battle in a cool looking level uh, and we'd somehow try to tell you that you should feel responsible. <coughs> However, some people around Naughty Dog uh, didn't think that this stroll through a quiet sunny space was going to work at all. We were planning to disallow the player from running in the sequence. Um, we were not going to let them jump or climb. Uh, and we were not going to allow them to perform any of their combat moves on the villagers or, or pull, out, pull out their gun. Now, people thought that this was going to be boring and that players would just recoil away from the constrained interactivity uh, when the rest of the game, leading up to that point, had been so rich. However, I had played a game around the time that we were talking about the sequence uh, that had made me think that this idea was definitely going to work. The name of the game was The Graveyard by Tale of Tales, uh, which, as you probably know, is a company whose core are the video game artists Aurea Harvey and Michael Salmon. Now, I'd been very affected by The Graveyard, much more than I expected to be when I first heard about it. Um, if you haven't played it, you should. As you can see, you play an old woman walking down a path uh, in a graveyard. Um, you can hear the wind in the trees, oh, I think. Yeah, you can hear the wind in the trees and the barking of a nearby dog and the chirping of birds which occasionally land on, on gravestones around you. Uh, you can, the clouds uh, passing overhead cast shadows across the path and the woman walks with a stick and, and has something of a limb. It seems monochrome and it's rendered with this beautiful, minimalistic, but very expressive stylization of reality. It's not a million miles away from Uncharted, un, Uncharted's stylized worlds. 
Now that's, that's not all there is to this experience, but I won't tell you anymore, I don't want to spoil it for you. I thought that in the same way that the graveyard could create a space for reflection in my daily life on the lunchtime when I played it, through a simplified version of the kind of, of uh, dense interactivity I expect from a, a third person character action game, so our peaceful village sequence could provide the same kind of meditative room in the experiential space uh, of Uncharted 2 players. <laughs> Guess I'm supposed to follow him. Now, in the peaceful village, we'd set things up initially so that you could still throw a punch in. Hey, how are you? Can't do it, but the, the NPCs wouldn't be affected by Hi, it. Hi, how are you? Can I do I noticed in an early playtest of the level that right at the start, many players rushed straight up to the nearest village. Uh, does the anyone button. speak English? And my suspicion was that people weren't trying to be mean. They were just testing the bounds hey, you, of Val? the interactivity uh, of the system. And uh, when I asked our playtesters uh, about this in, in the playtest exit interviews, they, they said, yeah, they weren't particularly trying to beat up the villagers. They, just interested to see what would happen if they if they tried to do something. Do you know? Oh. And initially that was. That I got cool. it. Follow you. Go somewhere. So I think that's a very human kind of, of curiosity, and and I liked it, and I wanted to reward it. Get our bearings. So we set up an animation that you've already seen. This animation would play if you did try to punch a villager, uh, and all it did was show Drake and the villager shaking hands. In the next playtest, the very next playtest, I saw players do exactly the same thing. They'd run straight up to the PC, and then they would light up with delight. I could see it in their body what? language. When their Aye. attempt at interaction yielded not quite the result they expected, but a result that fit into the context of the game at that point, in terms of human relationships in the game. Hey, how's it going? There we go. So after that, I worked uh, hard uh, with a bunch of the artists and animators at Naughty Dog. They actually did the really hard work uh, to create a number of short animated interactions that we then scattered around the world for the players uh, oh. who were inquisitive, <laughs> inquisitive enough to discover them. Dad, there you go. Get it. Kick it back. Mm. <laughs> Come on. So Kick it back. Kick it. Kick. kick. <laughs> Get it. Oh, kick the ball. Now, most players never see this, these spot interactions. Uh, the average player uh, just follows Tenzin, runs straight through the village on their first playthrough, and that takes about 70 seconds. But you can take your time and look around. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of people who okay. do that Be good boy. On, on their second playthrough. Um, Morning. And and your sense of reality of this place is really enhanced by all of these little things that you can discover if you're Gentlemen, do you speak English? About the world. Didn't think he got me caught a bit. Now, this level was a big Ooh, success I for us, even, even though it was really risky. And I was delighted by how many critics called it out in the and that, two reviews. I can't people uh, even still mention it to me uh, today. Uh, and I think its success is a sign that some video gamers are really quite hungry for this kind of open, self-directed experience. Now, none of these things I'm describing uh, as good and interesting uh, appeal to a particularly rich game system in a formal sense. Ooh. The gameplay affordances uh, that all of this stuff hinges off are, are pretty simple. Um, and the psychological effects that they achieve come primarily from the way that the content is authored and presented in terms of the graphics, the models, the animation, and, and the sound. You might consider this style of gameplay maybe theatrical or perhaps impressionistic. Um, and at Naughty Dog, we talk about it as experiential. Passage was another short, experiential, very emotionally charged game that made a huge impact on me about a year or so uh, before we implemented The Peaceful Village. Uh, and I thought a lot about Sword and Sorcery EP in the same light. Daniel Ben Mehdi's Today I Die and uh, the Chinese Room's Dear Esther. Um, Ian Bogost's A Slow Year and even though I haven't played it yet, Stout Games' Dinner Date uh, all seem to have very different takes 
on what seems to be, to me at least, a, a similar underlying idea, that of games as theatre or, or poetry. And these wonderful emotional psychological experiences are built from content, and as such, they're really time consuming to build. But the content is presented artfully in the framework of the right kind of interactive systemic apparatus, and uh, has been very carefully designed for a total art experience, in the same way that a dramaturg researches and designs a theatrical experience. And of course, I mustn't overlook these wonderful games, Flow, Flower and Journey by that game company, uh, which are both beautifully poetic and well-structured and interesting because of just how self-guided the experience of them is. More on that in a moment. So Uncharted 2's Peaceful Village, and consequently the game as a whole, owes something of a debt to these poetic experiential games. And although Uncharted 3 is packed to the gills with action and, and rich gameplay and epic set pieces, I think you're going to be interested to see how we've used experiential sequences of play to capture the sense of exploration and atmosphere that's so important to the Uncharted series. That's all I'll say about that for now. Uh, you'll have to wait until the 1st of November to find out more. Now, a video game, which I, like many people that I respect, um, uh, insist on running together into a single word, even though not even Blooming Wiktionary does, so we should go and fix that. Um, uh, uh, I, uh, I think that this is a good word. I think it's the right word to unite all of these digital play experiences uh, that we make and enjoy. It's a bloody confusing word because a lot of the video games we love really aren't very gamey, and the word game is, is right there. A game is a very specific kind of system of rules that players interact with to explore the space of the system dynamics that the rules produce, and then they try and nudge the system towards a specific state labeled the win condition. They're competing either against other players, usually against other players in the thousands of years of the history of games, uh, or against the system itself. Chess is a game, poker is a game, soccer is a game, solitaire is a game. But lots of video games and computer games don't have this element of competition in pursuit of a specific goal. That makes them more open-ended and also much riskier as potential entertainment and art experiences. Now, Minecraft is one of my favorite games of the last couple of years. I play it narratively uh, and exploratively uh, with the monsters turned on uh, rather than in its free-building creator mode. For me, it's somewhere between Lego I Am Legend <laughs> and the end of the world part of Haruki Murakami's hard-boiled wonderland and the end of the world. I'm in this world. I don't know where it is or what I'm doing there. I can make tools and a home for myself using the resources that I gather from the world, and I can explore it far and wide. But I have to be careful, because at night, the monsters come out. <laughs> so on this simple premise, I've played with this open-ended system for dozens and dozens and dozens of hours. There's no goal other than to survive uh, and to persist and to not drop all of my most precious shit in a far-off <laughs> corner of the world and lose it forever. I think I partly like it because it reminds me of running around free in the woods as a kid, making up stories as I went along. And as we know from our study of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-determination of this kind is very important for happiness. I really like this slide from the excellent talk that Ken Hudson gave at GEC and at various other places this year. Uh, it was called Player Driven Stories, How Do We Get There? And you can find it online uh, on his website. Uh, I have a lot to say about what Ken talked about, uh, most of it outside of the, the scope of this talk. Um, except to say that I think his concept of vertical agency, where you can interact with the game world at every level, from top to bottom, from the grossest level of the, the, the superstructure, the way you can explore what you do from hour to hour, 
down to uh, the very last atom of the game, down to each of the blocks that makes up the world of, of Minecraft. I think Minecraft expresses this concept of vertical agency absolutely perfectly. But the really interesting thing about Minecraft for me is uh, that it is not produced from authored content uh, in the way that I talked about earlier. Um, the coolness of Minecraft comes almost solely from systems with a thin layer of content to create symbolic affordances on top. So let me see that the world is made of earth and sand and stone and thereby imagine it more richly than I could if the blocks were just, say, color-coded. Now, one of the systems most fascinating to me uh, in the game is the one that produces each of these unique procedurally generated Minecraft worlds. And I heartily recommend Joshua Tippett's very readable, uh, though quite technical article in the April uh, 2011 edition of Game Developer Magazine. He talks about uh, combining fractal and noise functions in three dimensions to create the kinds of worlds uh, that uh, Minecraft is set in, with mountains and hills and valleys and lakes and scenes of different kinds of minerals. Uh, as my friend Andy Neeland said to me earlier this week, and in a way that I think also relates back to Jonathan's talk, um, a big part of the pleasure of Minecraft for the player then becomes about them applying their own subjective criteria for interestingness to their unique world, to find these local maxima of beauty and wonder uh, in a way that really hasn't been directly authored by the game's designer. And since the worlds of Minecraft are somewhat aleatoric, they're, they're produced by systems of rules that have a seed of chance in them, just like the music of Stockhausen or, or John Cage or, or some of the work of Brian Eno or the literary cut-ups of William Burroughs and some of the lyrics of David Bowie, the risk is that your Minecraft world might be boring and that the local maxima of interestingness or, or of beauty uh, might not be very tall or too few or too far apart. But of course, the initial conditions for the worlds seem to have been really cleverly constructed by Notch, the creator of Minecraft, to keep things pretty well in balance. So I don't know whether Minecraft is, is really a game, except that it is because I made a game out of it. It's maybe a kind of systemic theater. Uh, Jason Raw's Sleep is Death falls into the same camp uh, by a different route. Uh, I think SimCity is another similar kind of example. Now, this Monday night, I was lucky enough to be in New York City, and I went to see, I was taken to see, uh, by a very cool, wonderful person, an interactive, self-guided theatrical production called Sleep No More. It's by an award-winning British theatre company called Punch Drunk. This production, this theatrical production, took place throughout, I think, seven or so floors of an abandoned warehouse, which had been lovingly set-dressed to resemble a hotel frozen in time in the early 20th century. It's kind of a, a take on Macbeth and Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, sort of through the lens of Alfred Hitchcock. But we, the audience, once we'd been brought into the space, were free to roam at will from room to room, Looking at the sets, we were allowed to pick up the props, pick the candy off the tables if we were brave enough. <laughs> but then we would happen across actors in the space. Actors acting and dancing. Uh, and we were free to either follow them or not as they then moved through these spaces, acting out fragmented scenes. Um, it was, it was something between a, a choose-your-own-adventure play and, and some kind of cut-up. Uh, it was incredibly impactful. Um, it had very little dialogue. It had quite a lot of dance. Uh, and the dance was happening really inches from us. It was happening right here. But the actors were incredibly uh, self-controlled to be able to throw themselves and each other around without careening into us. And it really reinforced in me the idea that there is lots and lots to do here in both the physical and the digital worlds. And this is arguably the same territory that uh, ARGs, uh, uh, both kinds of ARGs, alternate reality games and augmented reality games, uh, and that LARPing, live action role playing lie in, where player psychology and the dynamics of human groups and human relationships somewhat take precedence over formal game systems. But maybe, and much more interestingly for game designers, 
um, where human psychology finds certain kinds of expression possible precisely because of some formal, if minimalistic, systemic constraints. In Sleep No More, uh, as we went into the first chamber, uh, we put on masks and we were forbidden from talking. And as soon as we put on these masks, you could feel the atmosphere change. Uh, it was just like stepping into Duzinga's magic circle. And finally, I think that maybe there's a loose mapping here to the MDA, the Mechanics Dynamics Aesthetics Framework that Mark LeBlanc, Robin Haneke, and Robert Zubek would find in their seminal paper. Inasmuch as the aesthetics part of MDA can encapsulate the, the psychological and emotional results of the interactions between system dynamics and people as whole, thinking, feeling beings. So this is murky territory, to be sure. But it's a place rich for investigation. And I think that what Tale of Tales describes as not games, expressive video games that shrug off the game part of their name, are interesting ways that we in the mainstream part of the games industry should look at very closely. Uh, Tale of Tales organized a, a not games festival this year in Cologne around the same time as Gamescom. Uh, I hope they do it again next year. We should all go. So having led us into this place that's kind of complicated and murky, I will now do my best to try and take us back out into the light. Even though the subjective, psychological, theatrical spaces I'm talking about are very grey areas for game designers, having worked on story games and having worked closely with really great storytellers like Amy and Bruce and Neil, it seems to me that we can often cut through the murk of human relationships with our very best design tools, which are clarity and simplicity, and straightforward language. There's an idea in movie making that each scene of a film should do just one thing. Uh, it should advance the story by exactly one step. The progression of the story ends up being clear then, and the components of the story are easy to name, and are things that we are familiar with, we are all familiar with, friendship, uh, enmity, love, hate, sex, death, passion, envy, sex, death, sex, and death. <laughs> when two characters are engaged in some complex interpersonal struggle, even if the overall direction of their relationship is ambiguous, which is often what keeps it interesting, it has to be clear in a good story what's happening right now. For example, this man is feeling awkward because his current girlfriend is meeting his ex-girlfriend, and so on. Now these kinds of subjective emotional concepts belong in games. In fact, they're the core experience of games. They're the aesthetics in MDA. But games, in the true sense of games, the formal sense of games, are built from number and space and logic and time. So the challenge is to squeeze emotion out of facts and sense impressions. But that's okay, that's just how art works, whether it's a painting or poetry, a great novel, or an art game. It's very hard to do this with game-like games, games with rules and strategies and win conditions. The emotions that, that gamey games conjure are usually associated with competition and with winning, uh, excitement, frustration, elation. But it is possible to conjure a greater range of emotion than that through very strictly game-like gameplay, as the amazing work of Eric Zimmerman and Matthew Posey, Rod Humble, Jonathan Blow, Jason Raw, Brenda Brathwaite, all of these amazing games designers shows. The approach offered by experiential, expressive games maybe lets us take a more direct route to these kinds of emotional experiences, though. But it can take a long time to build all of the content that you need. Maybe there's a more elegant solution, like the one that Minecraft uses. So whenever you hear me say, uh, and I say it from time to time, that if you want to be in pursuit of art in video games, you should make sure that your video game is about something, this is what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter whether your game is hardcore, ludic, and game-like, or whether it's loose and experiential and subjective. Your game should attempt to jump this boundary between dry conceptions of space and number 
and land in an area of human emotion and psychology, or complicated, or difficult, or different. And then they might tell you that you should go away and do something sensible. You know, like something that's been done before. <laughs> Don't listen to those people. If you have a talent, just use it. Be honest with yourself about what you're good at, and do that. Make something simple with the skills that you have, and then, most importantly, show it to someone. It doesn't matter if it's crappy. In fact, it should be crappy when you first show it to someone. If it's not, how is it going to get better when people help you with it? You have to collaborate. Tell your friends that you want to work on something with them, and then continue to communicate with them about it. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Uh, don't be a douchebag about it, but, <laughs> but be persistent. Be dogged. Also, say when you don't know something, because then people will teach you stuff. Solicit and listen to criticism. Don't make a fuss when something needs changing. Just, just change it. Everything in your design is important from top to bottom. Think hard about all of it, as if it was the last thing that you were ever going to make. Treat people with respect. That means both being tactful and being honest with them. Whenever possible, tell people the truth in, the way, in a way that they can hear. Be direct, but don't be a dick. Uh, our relationships are valuable, uh, and we should handle them with care. Be vulnerable. Being honest means opening up about your feelings as well as your thoughts. The best thing is that your vulnerability will help create an environment on the team where it's okay to make mistakes. And when that's the case, you can really, really start to fly with your rapid prototyping process and fail early, fail often. Above all, be honest with yourself. You're going to be an artist of some unknown new kind. It's going to be your responsibility to reveal complex facts about the state of what is in the world using mechanisms and metaphors. You're going to end up telling all of the truths. To paraphrase the author Ian Banks, all we ever are is a little bit of the universe thinking to itself. We're absolutely unique in space and time. We're irreplaceable. Too many of us live in pain, but we can also dwell in joy. And if we can use design, game design, any kind of design, to get a clearer insight into how we can elevate our fragile, beautiful condition, then maybe we'll have done something worthwhile, and it will have been worth the risk. Have an amazing indicator. Jack and Jesse, do you, you all mind come setting up while Rich takes a couple questions? I don't have to take questions, actually. I have a mortal fear of, of Q&A in, in talks. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer questions for him. <laughs> stall if he won't take oh, questions. but we, we, need, we need space? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, sure. So, yeah. Anyone? 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 Dealer? <laughs> no. Everything you, you, you accept it all is truth. Huh? All right, here well, we go. Um, I feel a little bit like your character in Tibet, you know, I'm a little bit of a Westerner in a foreign country because I'm a composer trying to make the transition from film and television uh, music into this world you guys inhabit. Oh, great. And I was really inspired by that particular experiential aspect of the game because it felt like something that really used to be someplace we could put our talent to. And um, I wondered where you saw that that connection coming in the future and how important music can be. Oh, I think that um, it's absolutely instrumental. Uh, I didn't really, considering that I'm a, a big fan of music, uh, do you want to just go ahead, Jack? Yes. Yeah, sure. You can close this down. Um, did I? And uh, I'll, I'll fix that in a future version of, of this talk. Um, yeah, I mean, music, just, just as in film, I think we learned this uh, in making these interactive cinematic video games. Uh, just as in film, music is really the thing that lets you immediately um, 
set very clearly an emotional tone for your audience. I even kind of tried to do it actually um, with the music that I used in my, my preamble. I kind of tried to be a dramaturge a little bit with this talk. Uh, I had loads more ideas that I wanted to use. I wanted to use props. I was actually, I was going to live DJ throughout this talk. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous idea. I, I only saw a sentence at about six o'clock this morning about that. But, uh, but hopefully the music that I played, going right the way back to about a quarter of an hour before the talk, you know, created a kind of emotional tone that then eased you into the space that I wanted this talk to inhabit. And the great news is, is that your core skills as a composer are all entirely applicable to the world of video games. Yeah, it's um, about storytelling. I mean, it's, and that's what's exciting for us is because at this point, it seems like the, the genre is becoming more and more about that. You know, it allows for it more like exactly that scene. You know, there's this poetical scene and you can choose to tangent for a while. Right, and that right. sounds like something that the music can help cue. Actually, I think in fact, normally it's about synergy. It's about the combination of, of animating image and music. I mean, Sword and Sorcery EP, Jim Guthrie's incredible score for that game is such an enormous part of what gives it this big emotional through line that it has. And it's about um, synchrony. I love the concept of synchrony. I think a, a lot of the beauty of video games, a lot of the great uh, what makes them um, somewhat unique is the way that when, when our action and something and a reaction that's both visual and auditory kind of comes together in a moment, especially where we've been planning towards something, that's really where the magic of this form of video games lies. So, yeah, it's just then a question of learning the, the concrete skills that you have to learn in setting up uh, an adaptive, interactive score. Right, the practical aspects. The, the practical aspects. So my advice is always to uh, try and get involved in an indie project or a student project, because yeah. that's great that's place to learn. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Take one more question and then we'll transition. Any right. way back there? Yeah, for sure. Uh, a lot of your questions, or a lot of your presentations on single player games, and the kinds of aesthetics and experience you have to have. So when you start adding multiple players, and then you've had experience with this for the first time, how do you address aesthetics? Uh, that's a good question. Sam's question is about how. Uh, uh, we address aesthetics in the con context of multiplayer games, and you're right, most of, the, most of my examples are uh, single player games. Um, to be honest, I haven't really thought about this in too much depth yet for uh, multiplayer games. I think that uh, Journey is breaking new ground, that game company's Journey is breaking new, new ground in, in that regard. Uh, just as they do with, with every one of their games. Um, I really want to play the multiplayer Minecraft yet, and I'm very keen to get going uh, with that. I mean, I think that um, all of the same opportunities are, are there. Um, we're still learning a lot about multiplayer games and how they can be exciting in the uh, sense of traditional games, I think, and uh, you know, in terms of cyber sports. Um, the multiplayer game in Charter 3, we, we work hard to try and hone our craft in that regard. But uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, in a, a few years, I'll come back and talk about that stuff. So. All right, thanks. So, thanks again, Rich.